Hello again, friends. Last week, we started up a series about the inspiration for Shakespeare's play, The Tempest, a letter that came back from an English colony in Jamestown, Virginia. Last time around, I read the tale of the trip over and the great storm that wrecked the flagship of the fleet crashing on the rocks surrounding the Bermuda Islands. The 150 men, with some women, who landed on the islands struggled to find food and plant crops and survive in these surroundings. Part one is also available on this site. Part two of this tale doubles back a bit to resume the story shortly after their desperate landing on the shore, towards the end of July 1609, through their anticipated relaunch of two smaller ships that they managed to build on the island, setting out again in May of 1610. We find those same men struggling with dissent and with occasional mutinies, much as the sailors of Shakespeare's Tempest struggled for food and liquor, sometimes plotting to kill each other amid their now seemingly lawless surroundings. And just as a point of interest, you might note that these events clearly predate the notion of a separation of church and state. It's hard to say how justified these Bermuda mutinies may have been. It seems that the common folk were little more than indentured servants. Clearly, the author of this work, William Strachey, Esquire, sides with the leadership, Sir Thomas Gates, the governor, and Sir George Summers, the admiral. We hear hints of differences between the common laborers and the mariners, whose seafaring skills gave them some social advantage, leading to an arrogance and a growing belligerence. It also seems that amid this interrupted voyage, there was some uncertainty as to whether the governor or the admiral or anyone for that matter had the authority to give orders at this point. When these men did reach Virginia, their survival and sudden appearance made for a sensational story, which clearly inspired Shakespeare in his tale of another storm at sea. That one set several thousand miles to the east in the Mediterranean. up this story a bit to make it more accessible to the modern audience, if only to give a sense of the work that fed the imagination that created The Tempest. A True Reportery, Part 2. Once we were a little settled on the islands, we made up our longboat in the fashion of a pinnace, gave her sails and oars, and entreated our master's mate, Henry Ravens, to make for Virginia, which might be some 140 leagues from us, or thereabouts. Ravens departed from us with six sailors and our Cape Merchant on Monday, August 28th, out of Gates's Bay. But to our much wonder, he returned again two nights later, as shoals and breaches kept him from getting clear of the island from the north-northeast. And so, on Friday, he proceeded to go out the same way we came in on the south-southeast of the islands, promising if he lived and arrived safe, he would return to us the next new moon with the pinnace belonging to the colony there. Our governor directed that fires be prepared as beacons to direct and waft him back in on his return. But two moons were wasted, holding watch upon the promontory, and many a long, hopeful look from the northeast to the southwest horizons were in vain, discovering nothing but air and sea. It may please you to know, excellent lady, that our governor dispatched this longboat out of foresight and fear his enforced absence from Virginia might give rise to a tumult, and held hopes that his letters would settle any such disturbances until his arrival. Our governor also directed a letter for the council in England, sending it to his lieutenant governor in Virginia by him to be dispatched from thence to England. In the meantime, Sir George Summers coasted the islands and drew up the plat of them while daily fishing and hunting for our whole company. By late November, as we realized that we were not likely to hear from Virginia and that the pinnace which Richard Frobisher was building would not be sufficient to transport all our men, Sir George arranged for two carpenters and twenty men to work with him on the main island to frame up a second little bark for the better conveyance of our people, and, with the best of our men to hew and square timber, a small vessel was soon made ready. 
And sure, it was happy for us that we had our governor with us, one so solicitous and careful, whose authority could lay shame and command upon our people. Otherwise, most of us would have finished our days there. So willing were the common sort, especially when they found such a plenty of victuals, to simply decide to remain on those islands forever. Some dangerous and secret discontent began to arise, first in the seamen, who in time had fastened unto them by false baits many of our landmen, some of whom, for opinion of their religion, were held in an extraordinary and good respect. These men thus preached and published to each other such a, a murmur and discontent that the men's hearts and hands were divided from their labor. By September, a conspiracy was discovered among six men, who each pledged not to set their hands to expedite the construction of this pinnace. Likewise, they drew the smith and one of our carpenters into the conspiracy, and like outlaws, they retired into the woods to make a settlement and habitation. They purposed to leave our quarter and possess another island by themselves. But once this was found out, they were condemned to the, the same punishment which they would have chosen, but without smith or carpenter and to an island far by itself they were carried and left. But soon those who were removed from our store missed the comfort of our society, which wrought in some of them a sorrow and a weariness. Many humble petitions, fraught full of repentance and vows, were sent unto our governor, who, in light of their shame and contrition, was easily content to acknowledge them again. And yet... Such generous forgiveness could not serve as any warning to others, and therein did one Stephen Hopkins, a fellow who had much knowledge in the scriptures, argue that it was no breach of honesty, conscience, nor religion to decline from the obedience of the governor, insisting that the authority ceased when the rack was committed, which freed them from the government of any man. They reasoned, in light of God's providence of all manner of good food, to remain on these islands, arguing that should they yet grow weary of this place, they might build a small bark with the skill and help of the aforesaid carpenter and get clear from hence at their own pleasures. This being thus discovered, the governor revealed this offense before the whole company, bringing the prisoner forth in manacles where he was accused of each particular. He responded, with sorrow and tears, but being found the captain of this mutiny, he was charged with the sacrifice of his life. But so penitent he was, and made so much moan, alleging the ruin of his wife and children in his trespass, it wrought a pity in the hearts of all the better sort of the company, including myself, who, with humble entreaties, went unto our governor and never left him until we had got his pardon. And yet, an even worse faction took hold, this one deadly and bloody, in which the life of our governor with many others were threatened. There were those who insisted our governor neither durst nor had authority to pass the act of justice for the unlawfulness of any act, however treacherous or impious. They purposed to make a surprise of the storehouse and to force from thence what was therein, either of meal, cloth, arms, sails, oars, or what else it pleased God that we had recovered from the rack, to serve our general necessity and use. But, as all giddy and lawless attempts have something of imperfection, there were some who break from the plot and revealed every agent thereof. And yet, as the Confederates were divided and separated, some with us and most with Sir George Summers in his island, they were not suddenly apprehended. As such, from thenceforth every man was commanded to wear his weapon, with every man advised to stand upon his guard, his own life not being in safety, whilst his next neighbor was not to be trusted. Nothing was further attempted until a gentleman amongst them, one Henry Payne, stole swords, hatchets, saws, mallets, and more from our supply, and when his watch night came about to be on guard, did not only give his commander evil language, but struck at him, telling him, in such unreverent terms as I should offend the modest ear too much to express it in his own phrase, 
But the contents were that the governor had no authority of that quality to justify upon anyone an action of that nature, and therefore let the governor, said he, kiss, etc., which words being with the omitted additions delivered over to the governor, who had now the eyes of the whole colony fixed upon him and condemned him to be instantly hanged. And with the latter being ready, following many confessions, he earnestly desired, being a gentleman, that he might instead be shot to death. And towards the evening, Henry Payne had his desire, the sun and his life, setting together. But upon hearing of this, the others who had been with Sir George, fearing that Payne had implicated them by a mutual consent, forsook their labor and, like outlaws, betook to the wild woods. Whether by greed or perhaps the desire to forever inhabit here, they sent an audacious and formal petition, not only entreating our governor that they might stay here, but importune that he not waive from past promises to furnish each of them with two suits of apparel and contribute meal rateably for one whole year. Our governor wrote back to this effect, that his purpose was not to forsake them like savages, but to leave them all things fitting to defend them from want and wretchedness. But at the same time, he entreated Sir George to signify unto them what an imputation and infamy it might be to their own proper reputations, assuring them that whatsoever they had practiced hitherto should not in any sort be imputed against them. Sir George won over all but Christopher Carter and Robert Waters, who by no means would any more come amongst Sir George's men. That Waters was a sailor, who at his first landing upon the island, as you shall hear, killed another fellow sailor. During our time on these islands, every Sunday we had two sermons preached by our minister, and every morning and evening we repaired all to public prayer, at which time the names of each of our company were called, and such as found absent were punished. It pleased God also to give us opportunity to perform all the other offices and rites of our Christian profession in this island, as marriage. One of Sir George Summer's men married a maidservant of one Mistress Horton, and we had the child of one John Rolfe and the aforesaid Mistress Horton christened a daughter, and we named it Bermuda as also the wife of one Edward Eason, being delivered the week before of a boy, had him then christened, and we named it Bermudas. Likewise, we buried five of our company, one untimely, a sailor being villainously killed by the foresaid Robert Waters, who strake him with a shovel, for which he was apprehended and appointed to be hanged. But being bound fast to a tree all that night, his fellow sailors, in despite and disdain that justice should be showed upon a sailor, not taking into the consideration the unmanliness of the murder nor the horror of the sin, cut his bands and conveyed him into the woods. Having laid the keel of our pinnace by this time, we now began to caulk. We had preserved unto us one barrel of pitch and another of tar, which served our use some way upon the bilge, the 30th of March, being Friday, we towed her out into the morning spring tide. She was 40 foot by the keel and 19 foot broad at the beam. The most part of her timber was cedar. Her beams were all oak preserved from our ruined ship. When she began to swim upon her launching, our governor called her the Deliverance. Before we dislodged to the fresh water, our governor set up a memorial in figure of a cross made of some of the timber of our ruined ship. In the midst of the cross, he fastened the picture of his majesty in a piece of silver of twelve pence, and on each side of the cross he set an inscription graven in copper to this purpose. In memory of our great deliverance, both from a mighty storm and leak, we have set up this to the honor of God. It is the spoil of an English ship of 300 ton called the Sea Venture, bound with seven ships more, from which the storm divided us. 
In it were two knights, Sir Thomas Gates, knight, governor of the English forces and colony there, and Sir George Summers, knights, admiral of the seas. Her captain was Christopher Newport. Passengers and mariners she had beside 150. We were forced to run her ashore by reason of her leak, which we discovered first the 28th of July, 1609. About the last of April, Sir George Summers launched his newly made pinnace and brought her into the channel where ours did ride, and she was, by the keel, nine and twenty foot, at the beam fifteen foot and a half, and he called her the Patience. And so ends part two. Any of this remind you of the Tempest? Perhaps the descent and disruption that bubble to the surface when man is set free from the typical strictures of civilization amid a a wild and unstructured nature. The balance of nature versus art is an important theme in The Tempest and will come up again in the coming chapters of this true reportery. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I'll be back with part three, but in the meantime, you can catch me touring the Fringe Circuit this summer, 2023, with performances of Breakneck Romeo and Juliet in Kansas City and Indianapolis, and the world premiere of Breakneck Midsummer Night's Dream in Minnesota. If you can't make those, you can always buy a ticket for online viewing at breakneckshakespeare.com. There are other freebies available, like the full performance of Shakespeare's Histories for no charge. I drop videos like this online on a regular basis. There are maybe a hundred about Shakespeare on this site, so explore. And hit the subscribe button to catch new stuff as it becomes available. I hope to see you online and perhaps on the road as I tour Shakespeare to whomever I might share these events. See you on the stage.